global diversification is one of the keys to a well-constructed portfolio. We've known this for a long time, and investors have been largely ignoring it for just as long. In a 1991 paper titled Investor Diversification and International Equity Markets, Ken French and James Paterba documented the concept of investors' preference for owning stocks in their home country, commonly known today as home country bias. French and Paterba found that the preference for domestic stocks was driven by investors expecting higher returns in their domestic markets compared to other markets. When they wrote the paper in 1991, they found that between 80 and 98% of investor portfolios consisted of domestic stocks, depending on the country they were looking at. Today, things have gotten a bit better, but investors still have a strong preference for the stocks in their home country. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to tell you why a little home country bias might not be such a bad thing. A 2017 Vanguard paper titled The Global Case for Strategic Asset Allocation and an Examination of Home Bias documented the extent of home bias in several countries, including Canada. They found that while the Canadian market makes up about 3% of the global market, Canadian investors' portfolios were closer to 60% invested in Canadian stocks. The logical argument for global diversification in a portfolio is strong. You gain access to economies outside of your home country. This can be particularly important over the long term. In a 2011 paper from AQR, the authors explained that country-specific economic performance drives long-term stock returns. Investing in a single country that happens to have poor long-term economic performance could be disastrous for the investor. No problem, we diversify globally. Similarly, we know that the majority of the global market's stock returns come from a very small subset of global stocks. In their 2019 paper, Do Global Stocks Outperform U.S. Treasury Bills?, the authors found that the net wealth creation in global stock markets from 1990 through 2018 was explained by only 1.3% of global stocks. Again, we don't know which stocks those will be, or which countries they will reside in, so we diversify globally. There are other good arguments for global diversification. Adding international equities to a domestic portfolio tends to decrease risk, as measured by volatility, and increase expected returns. In Vanguard's 2019 paper, Global Equity Investing, The Benefits of Diversification and Sizing Your Allocation, the authors showed that adding global stocks to a domestic equity portfolio decreases portfolio volatility. One of the most interesting takeaways from this Vanguard paper is that the amount of global diversification matters. It is not necessarily the case that we need to follow market cap weights to get the full benefits of global diversification. In terms of volatility reduction, Vanguard found that the maximum expected volatility reduction was achieved when a Canadian investor allocates somewhere between 50 and 60% of their equity portfolio to non-Canadian stocks. Allocating more than that increased volatility in their model. There is definitely an incremental benefit to adding non-Canadian stocks to a Canadian equity portfolio. But from an expected volatility perspective, the marginal benefit of adding non-Canadian stocks does start to decline quickly when we get above a 60% allocation. Vanguard found similar results for other countries. Now, modeling expected volatility is not the only approach that we want to take to building a portfolio. An over-reliance on models is always dangerous because future outcomes are uncertain. But we can see that using market cap weights for geographic allocations is not necessarily the best approach in terms of volatility reduction for an investor in a given country. So far we've seen that global diversification is important, but the benefits from a volatility reduction perspective can be achieved while still maintaining a substantial home country bias. Remember, market cap weights would see Canadian investors with a roughly 3% allocation to Canadian stocks which would be suboptimal based on Vanguard's expected volatility analysis. The concept of home bias gets more interesting when we start thinking about some of the other factors that impact investment outcomes. Minimizing volatility and gaining long-term access to foreign economies are good things, but real-life investors also need to think about costs, taxes, and their own behavior. The cost of index ETFs has continuously fallen in recent years, to the point that investing is almost free in terms of management expense ratios. A Canadian investor can buy an ETF of Canadian stocks, like XIC, for a management expense ratio of 0.06%, and an ETF of US stocks, like XUU, for a management expense ratio of 0.07%. When we get outside of North America, though, the fees get higher. 
An ETF of international developed market stocks like XEF has a much higher expense ratio at 0.22%, and XEC, tracking emerging markets, is even more expensive at 0.26%. Fees are important, but taxes are an even bigger consideration. Canadian public companies generally distribute eligible dividends. An eligible Canadian dividend received by a Canadian taxpayer is taxed more favorably than a foreign dividend in a taxable investment account. At the highest marginal tax rate in Ontario in 2019, an eligible dividend is taxed at 39.34% after the gross-up and dividend tax credit are considered, while a foreign dividend is taxed as regular income at a rate of 53.53%. This is a meaningful difference for a taxable investor. Even if you are investing in a tax-advantaged account, like the RRSP or TFSA, there is a meaningful tax cost to owning foreign securities. When a dividend is paid to a foreign asset owner, there is generally a withholding tax applied. For example, the US withholds 15% of any dividend paid to a Canadian asset owner. In a taxable investment account, this foreign withholding tax is recoverable it can be used to offset your Canadian taxes. In a registered account, this foreign withholding tax is not recoverable. XUU, the iShares Core S&P US Total Market Index ETF, currently has a dividend yield of about 1.8%, which translates to an unrecoverable foreign withholding tax cost of 0.27% when it is held in an RSP or TFSA. The situation is similar for XEF with an estimated unrecoverable foreign withholding tax cost of 0.22%. XEC endures two levels of withholding tax, because instead of owning the underlying stocks directly, it owns a US listed ETF of emerging market stocks. The result is one level of unrecoverable foreign withholding tax, even in a taxable account, estimated at 0.35%, and two levels of unrecoverable foreign withholding tax in an RRSP or TFSA totaling around 0.70%. Some of these unrecoverable foreign withholding tax costs can be reduced or eliminated by holding US listed ETFs in an RSP account. The US does not apply foreign withholding tax on assets held specifically in an RSP account. This solution to withholding tax costs introduces the added complexity of converting currency to purchase US listed ETFs, which is not attractive to many investors. If you own a Canadian-listed asset allocation ETF, like XEQT, you are not able to take advantage of this nuance because XEQT is a Canadian-listed ETF. It is very important to understand that this is not that bad of a thing. I don't want everyone to run off and sell XEQT to buy the underlying US-listed ETFs in their RRSP to reduce their foreign withholding tax costs. The point is that owning non-Canadian stocks in Canadian tax-advantaged accounts comes with an added level of tax cost. Whether we are talking about taxable or non-taxable accounts, there is little question that Canadian stocks are more tax efficient than non-Canadian stocks. That was a bit of a tax digression, but it was important. Investing outside of Canada comes with higher costs and taxes for a Canadian investor. If we are thinking about our optimal geographic allocations, we might have started at market capitalization weights to diversify our exposure to global economies, and then we might have increased our allocation to Canadian equities based on the Vanguard mean variance analysis. And now with the information on costs and taxes, we might nudge that Canadian equity allocation a little higher. One of the things that I often hear about investing in Canada is that the market is poorly diversified. We have too much energy and financials. This is true, but the rest of the world is relatively light on these sectors. So loading up on Canadian stocks above market cap weight does not result in a concerning level of sector exposure at the portfolio level. Costs and taxes aside, Canadian investors are faced with a major behavioral challenge. We are in Canada. The Canadian stock market is in our faces every day. If the Swedish stock market goes on a bull run, we Canadians probably won't notice. But if the Canadian stock market goes on a bull run, we can't ignore it. Knowing the behavioral tendencies of investors, there is a meaningful risk that Canadian investors owning the 3% market cap weight of Canadian stocks in their portfolio will feel the urge to increase that allocation if the Canadian stock market is doing well. A classic case of buying high. One aspect of the geographic allocation decision that does not carry much weight is currency. Some people may feel that foreign currency exposure increases the risk of their portfolio. In Vanguard's analysis, they found currency to contribute a very small amount to the overall volatility effects of diversifying outside of Canada. Other studies have found that currency exposure can either increase or decrease portfolio volatility 
depending on the time period. Within equities, currency volatility ends up being similar in magnitude to equity volatility while being imperfectly correlated, potentially offering a diversification benefit. If you felt strongly enough about currency exposure, you could always hedge it. In short, currency does not play a meaningful role in the home bias decision. Based on these factors, there are trade-offs that we have to think about. We know that diversification outside of Canada is important, but too much diversification might actually increase portfolio volatility, at least based on Vanguard's model. We also know that the cost of investing outside of Canada is a bit higher than investing in Canada in terms of fees and taxes, and from a behavioral perspective, it might feel bad to own very little Canadian stocks when the Canadian stock market is doing well. Understanding these trade-offs, it is not obvious how much home bias is optimal, but I do think that there is a good argument for some. With no objectively optimal geographic allocation, following a simple equal split across Canadian, US, and international stocks is probably a sensible solution. This is how the Vanguard asset allocation ETFs like VEQT are approaching geographic allocation. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital, and this is Common Sense Investing. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. Don't forget, if you've run out of Common Sense Investing videos to watch, you can tune in to weekly episodes of the Rational Reminder podcast wherever you get your podcasts.